11 is where we're going to be this morning, continuing on our uh, walk through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, this morning is a very uh, familiar passage, if you have read the Gospels. And, and, and Matthew's Gospel, it comes a lot later than it does in this one because of the way that Matthew has put his Gospel together. Um, remember, when we talked about going through the book of Luke, Luke is most likely the most linear of Jesus' um, uh, a gospel regarding about Jesus and the timeline of Jesus' ministry. Because Luke is a, he's a Greek writer, and all the rest of the writers are all Hebrews, and so Hebrews don't think necessarily linearly when they're telling stories. They're thinking with regard to these are important events, and these events sort of go together, so I'm going to put these together. Um, so, so Luke... Um, gives us this here, which is likely that when Jesus was giving this discourse against the Pharisees and the scribes that we're going to see this morning in Luke chapter 11. I, I guess I didn't see the verses. I apologize. I have seen the verses yet. Um, we're looking at verses 37 through 54 this morning, the last part of the book of, of Luke chapter 11. That he gives it at this point in time as opposed to the point that Matthew has it. So just kind of an interesting thing as we continue on. Um, it has been often said that people uh, don't want to come to church because they say, well, that church down there, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. They're all full of hypocrites. The church in general, they're just full of hypocrites. And that, One of the my resources I go to whenever I study for Sunday mornings is uh, R.C. Sproul's commentary on the book of Luke. And I really enjoy the way that he handles Luke. And it's always my first place to go to. And I really like that. And I really like what he had to say about that particular passage, or about that saying here. He said, that's a very slanderous accusation given to the church. Um, the church does include hypocrites, for sure. There are, I'm not saying that there aren't hypocrites in the church. There are hypocrites in the church, but the church is not full of hypocrites. Because when people talk about hypocrisy, they're often <coughs> conflating the idea of just general understanding of sin and hypocrisy. The, sin, the church is full of sinners. In fact, it's the prerequisite for entering into the Christian faith. You must acknowledge that you are a sinner before you can come to faith in Christ Jesus and receive mercy and grace through repentance. The church is absolutely full of sinners. If you think you are in this room and you are not a sinner, uh, you have no place in this church because you're, you're going to hate the fact that everybody around you is an absolute sinner. The church is full of sinners. Among those sinners, some people are hypocrites. See, a hypocrite is somebody who is pretending to be something that they're not. Or they're asking other people to do something that they themselves are not willing to do. See, the real problem is when sinners in the church start acting or behaving as if they're not sinners when they are. And see, there's no place for a, a holier-than-thou attitude in the church because, uh, as I've heard it said often, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There are no big I's or little U's in the kingdom of God. That we are all sinners. In fact, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, he says, If you say that you have no sin, you are a liar. <laughs> and the truth is not in you. Because every single person in this room, every person watching this video this morning, is a sinner. So when we talk about hypocrisy, we're not talking about... Sinners, though sinners are, or hypocrites are sinners. Hypocrisy is a specialized type of sin. Now we're getting into categories of sin. Not every sinner is a hypocrite, but every hypocrite is indeed a sinner. And so, so we're going to talk about that. I wanted to make sure we sort of are understanding that as we begin this passage of Scripture. Because Jesus, in his discourse as he goes through the Gospel of Luke in chapter 11 here, he is going to talk about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the scribes. 
So we need to understand that. There's a distinction that Jesus is making with regard to the, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes about being hypocrites. But, but that is different from generally the understanding of being a sinner. So let's read in verse 37 through the end of the chapter. Verse 37 begins, While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools! Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give alms to those that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb, and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, you are like unmarked graves. And people walk over them without knowing it. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you uh, build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. You are witnesses. And you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who, en who are entering. As they went away from there, as he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is our prayer that you would speak to us through your word. We know that the words that we just read are the words that were uttered by Luke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, written for us that we may know you and that we may um, repent and trust in you. Father, I pray that you would apply this word to our hearts and give me the words to speak this morning. And when you're finished, shut my mouth. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Woe to the hypocrites. That's what we're calling this morning's message. Woe to the hypocrites. Jesus, all of chapter 11 has the same context. It all began several weeks ago whenever Jesus was driving out a demon from a man who was mute. And this, this demon was causing the muteness within this man. And we know that because of that, there were three reactions that came upon the people because of this. One was that some marveled, some believed, and they, and they were amazed at this amazing thing that, that Jesus had done. Another was that some uh, began to slander Jesus and say that he drives out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And there was a third category that said, that's not good enough. That was a great little parlor trick, Jesus, but we need to see more signs from you before we're going to believe in you. And so then Jesus systematically deals with each one of these groups of people. He doesn't have to deal with the ones who believe, but he deals with the ones who slandered him. He deals with the ones who uh, were the skeptics and asked for more evidence, and he talked about all of these things. And so that's what it's talking about. That's our context whenever it says that while Jesus was speaking. Okay? So I imagine a Pharisee here that is coming to Jesus is probably among one of the ones who was either skeptical or they were accusing Jesus of driving out demons uh, by the prince of demons. Because we're going to find that this hypocrisy actually began with this very invitation. <laughs> if you think about it, this Pharisee was not inviting Jesus to his house because he was really excited to get to know Jesus and wanted to hear more of his teaching and things like that. We know that this is a war zone that's happened. 
He's inviting Jesus in under a false pretense of wanting to begin to accuse him and all of these things. And so um, it says that while Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. The best part of this, I think, is that it says, so he went in and reclined at the table. Jesus, I'm sure, knew exactly what he was walking into. He knew the hearts of men, it says other, elsewhere in the scriptures. And so he, going into this Pharisee's household, knew that he was walking into what was going to turn into a battle, most likely. And I love this. I love this about Christ. He's like John Wayne in the sense that he is not afraid to run into trouble. He's not afraid to step into this. I am very amazed every time I see things like this that shows how strong, how tough, and how courageous Jesus was in everything that he did. He wasn't just some weak sort of, you know, servant, you know. <laughs> uh, he is the, the suffering servant, but he came with great authority. He came with great power. He came with, he's, he's, he's a man's man, so to speak. He's not afraid to back down from conflict. Uh, he's a strong person that we can trust and we can walk and follow and we can put into practice the things that he did and, 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 and just with great honor and respect for what he did. Jesus is always doing this. He's not afraid of a fight. He's not afraid to back down. He's ready to challenge the establishment. He, uh, or he, you know, he's, you know what I meant. Sorry. Thanks for the look. I, can, I got the look that what you just said was stupid and it didn't make sense. Um, he's not going to back down because he's not afraid. Is that better? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, the Pharisee was astonished, it says. So he comes in, he sits down at the table, he's reclined. <laughs> he's in a place of rest. I mean, he's just not afraid at all. And the Pharisee, it says, was astonished. The word astonished there, he was like amazed, sort of a grasping at the pearls. <gasps> oh my goodness, I can't believe, it says, it was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. Now, this astonishment was not being grossed out because he didn't wash his hands and his hands were dirty and things like that. This washing that is speaking about in the scriptures here is a ceremonial washing that was introduced by the Pharisaical oral law um, before eating. This was, this was a, um, uh, a ritualistic, legalistic practice that the Pharisees had imposed upon people and imposed upon themselves that you should wash your hands in a ceremonial way before you eat dinner. Well, Jesus was very concerned about upholding the Word of God. He was not concerned about upholding the laws and the traditions of the Pharisees. So, he did not wash his hands before dinner in the ceremonial way so that the people would have seen that he's not going to follow their rules. And so, the, the Pharisee is astonished by this. They're, 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 he's, he's amazed that Jesus is not keeping these rules and regulations. Um, this is called legalism. Legalism is not, let's talk about what it's not first. Legalism is not that you're obeying the words that the scripture has to say. That's called obedience. That's good. That's what God has called us to do. Uh, I think that in our day and age, because we live in such a permissive society, that when we call people to repentance and to obey the word of God in their lives, people just say, oh, you're being legalistic. Or you're just being judgy. You can't judge me. Uh, well, that's, not, that's neither being legalistic, nor is it being judgmental. It is calling people to repentance and obedience. So whenever the scripture tells us to do something, and we say that so and so or such and such, is, is, it, this is a sinful practice, and you need to repent of this, and you need to be doing this, and it's in scripture clearly defined, that is not legalism. Okay? What legalism is, is adding something on top of that. Okay? Going to a movie theater is an issue of conscience. Okay? If you go to a movie theater to watch a movie, there's nothing in the scripture about movie theaters, 
about movies, anything like that. I'm bringing this up because this is a, you know, an old sort of legalistic practice or rule that people have imposed on other people. It's an issue of conscience, okay? You have to decide, according to Romans 14, whether that's something in which you're going to participate. You know, playing cards, dancing, wearing, you know, women wearing pants, whatever, things like that. All of these different legalistic things that have been brought on, these are all things above and beyond what the scriptures have to say. Those are all issues of conscience. But when people take those external things and they start imposing them on people as if you are breaking God's law by doing these things or not doing these things, then that becomes legalism. Okay? The rules and regulations that are placed on top of the law. So that's what's happening here. That's where the real rub is happening. So Jesus answers and he says to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside of uh, make the inside also, but give alms to those that are within? And behold, everything is clean to you. Jesus, since he's sitting down at dinner, and since there are cups and dishes laid out before him, takes these and uses them as an illustration. I love how Christ is always doing this. When he says things like, I am the door, or I am the great shepherd, I am the bread of life, or the water of life, or things like that. He's often taking these objects that are around and using them to communicate this truth about himself. And so now he's going to take the objects that are there on that table. They're all sitting at the table. They're all dishes right there before them. And he says, you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside are full of greed and wickedness. What is Jesus doing? He's taking this object lesson and he's applying it to them. Now imagine those cups were filled with something disgusting, or, 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 or maybe they were filled the night before, were never washed from the night before, and then you just poured more something into them, okay? But you took that outside, and you scrubbed it nice and clean, and maybe you polished it, it was real shiny, but inside of the cup is just <coughs> gross. It's nasty. Boy, it looks good from the outside, but the inside is full of this disgustingness. Jesus is taking that object, and he's saying, okay, this is what your Pharisees are like. You love the way you look before other people. You love to make your outside look good. Oh yeah, I do my ceremonial washings before I eat. Oh, I do this and that and the other thing. And I'm very particular about doing these things. In order to make your appearance look good before other people. But inside, you are filthy. Inside, you are disgusting. Your heart is unrepentant. Your lifestyle is unchanged. That you look good to people on the outside in your appearance. You have a mask that shows everybody else out there that says, Boy, that guy, he's really, he seems to be really devoted to God because of all these things that he's doing. But inside, you're filthy. And so that's what Jesus is saying about these Pharisees. You fools, he says, that word fool there is is the biblical understanding of fool in the sense of, you know, when we think about fool today, we think of somebody who's stupid or a dullard or something like that. But fool, according to the biblical understanding of things, is not taking the Word of God and doing it. Okay? Wisdom is taking the Word of God and doing it. Now, you can be foolish in your activity in a lot of different ways, but that's because you're foolish by not taking what God says to do about things like finances or parenting or marriage or things like that. You can be foolish in a lot of different ways, but it all has to do with this idea of not taking the wisdom of God revealed in the Scriptures and putting it into practice. These Pharisees are not doing the Word of God. They're fools because they're following these other rules, but they're not putting into practice what the Word of God actually has to say. Instead it says, inside you are full of greed... And wickedness. This word greed was very interesting. It means like to pillage or to plunder. Okay, so not, it's like violently seeking greed. It's like seeking money and things at all costs and not caring about anybody else in your pursuit of it. And this wickedness 
Um, this, this word wickedness is the general understanding of evil or wickedness or wicked practices. So you look great on the outside, but inside you are full of ravenous, self-serving greed and wickedness. Give alms to those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. Jesus is about to transition into tithing here in just a minute. So let's think about this for a minute as I want to make a point of application. Things like not going to movies, you know, not dancing, not playing cards, not, you know, wearing certain clothing or things along those lines. Those are easy things. Those are easy things to keep up appearances and make yourself look good in front of others. Things like loving your neighbor and giving out of a sacrificial heart. Loving your enemy. Following the Word of God and, and doing the one and others in Scripture. You know, forgiving one another. Seeking um, to, to bring restitution for a wrong that's been committed. Things along those lines. Keeping the Word of God, that's tough. That's tough. So if you're really, really good at not going to bad movies, but you're really, really bad about not loving your enemy, well, which one of those things is more important? Which one of those things are weightier? Well, obviously, it's participation and practice of the Word of God. See, that's what happens with legalism, is that, is that you make yourself sort of feel better about, I'm doing these things, but I feel failed in the way that I'm keeping the scriptures. It's a way to justify yourself and make yourself look better amongst other people while simultaneously fail to continue to work or to walk in a, a justified way before God. Now we understand that we're, 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 we're rescued, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. Without a shadow of a doubt. And I'm not talking about any sort of works-based salvation here. But Jesus does say that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he has told us on multiple occasions the way that we can serve and love him and love others. We ought to be paying attention to those things instead of the ritualistic, legalistic trappings otherwise. Let's continue. But woe to you Pharisees! So Jesus now uses this this individual Pharisee that he's talking about and, and sort of then turns... And he starts giving a broad uh, uh, um, discourse about all of the Pharisees. And so he starts off by saying, Woe! This pronouncement of judgment. This pronouncement of, of bad tidings coming upon the Pharisees. And not only does he say, Woe! If you'll notice, he keeps repeating the phrase, Woe to you for this! Woe to you for this! Woe to you for this! And whenever the Scriptures repeat something, it means that it's bearing a uh, great uh, um, gravity to the situation, that they're continuing to pronounce woes. Jesus is continuing to pronounce these woes. So He first says, Woe to you Pharisees! And this is the reason why He says, Woe! For you tithe! What? <laughs> that seems strange. But let's talk about what's going on here. For you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So let's talk about this. The Pharisees were very scrupulous in their tithing. They were very meticulous in the way that, that they would tithe. So not only would they tithe, you know, firstly, the commandment to tithe is a scriptural commandment. Okay? We ought to be people who are tithers. But what these Pharisees did was they were so meticulous, they would spend all their time making sure, you know, if I have ten leaves of mint here, I better make sure one of those leaves of mint goes into the offering plate. You see, they were very meticulous, very careful to look like, to make sure, boy, I better make sure all of my tithing is exactly appropriate and specific and everything like that. And there's nothing wrong with tithing, but in doing so, they were so focused on that that they forgot about things like justice and mercy. Because they were so wrapped up in their, in their outward appearances, so wrapped up in their practices that they forgot to perform the law. So 
So if you're a tither, that makes you at least qualified enough to be a Pharisee. <laughs> what does that make you if you're not? That's condemning. Tithing is good. It's right. It's appropriate. It's commanded by God. To not tithe means to be in disobedience with God. So we ought to be people who are tithing. Tithing is a representation of, firstly, God has given us everything. So we understand that God has given me the literal breath of my nostrils, the breath of my lungs, the, and, and, and He has given me the ability to work and earn an income. And He says, all I'm asking for is 10%. It's faith, it's participation in the ministry of God, it's participation in this church continuing to serve this community, and in other places I give, we, we give some of our stuff to like Ligonier and things like that as well, because they're doing work to spread the gospel through the world. So be a tither, be a tither, that's commanded by God, don't walk in disobedience to God by not tithing your income. But, also, don't let that be the only thing that you do. You know, um, part of growing up in a, in a um, or come, getting saved into a um, particular denomination that was very good about sending missionaries to the world is that they always had offerings for missionaries because they fully supported missionaries and it was wonderful, you know. It was, you know, they had these offerings, or the Andy Armstrong offering, and the Lottie Moon offering, and all these things that were meant to support missionaries to send them out to the world. Then they're part of that, went to disaster relief programs and things like that. And I think that a great application of this might be that if all you're willing to do is pay for somebody else to go do the work of the ministry, but you yourself are not willing to go do the work of the ministry, then Jesus might be speaking to you like he's speaking to the Pharisees here. We have all been called to do things like biblical justice. Not social justice, not this CRT, satanic, Marxist nonsense, but biblical justice. We have been called to do things like remember the poor and to give, to minister to people in the, in the gospel. In the gospel. And so we ought to also, we should, we should be tithing our income. We should be participating and giving of that, but we should also be participating and giving our ourselves to minister to others as well. So the Pharisees thought, well, if I just really, really, really scrupulous in my tithing, I don't have to do all this other stuff. Because look at all this that I've done. I give all this money, look at me. Verse 43, Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. That's the next piece. They, were, they loved the praise of men. They loved to be situated and seated in the best places. They loved it when people walked up to them in the streets and said, Brother, boy, it sure is good to see you. And boy, that was such a great message last week. And things like that. They loved the praise and the accolades of men. We ought to be seeking the praise and the accolades of God above men. Verse 44, Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. In the Old Testament law, there was a commandment that says that if you were exposed to uh, something that was dead, a dead person or something along those lines, um, that you were unclean, you were ceremonially unclean, you were defiled, by touching that dead thing. And so uh, whenever Jesus says you're like unmarked graves, um, that's like walking over a grave and not realizing that you were defiled. And so what Jesus is saying here is people come to you and they're seeking from you the words of life, but instead they're only getting defilement and death from you. That you are causing other people to become defiled because as they mimic you, <coughs> As they learn from you, as they emulate your practices, they are joining in your um, death. They're joining in your defilement. They don't even realize that they're walking over an unmarked grave. That's scary to me, along with another thing that's going to be mentioned here when Jesus talks to the lawyers. The idea of how are we leading people? 
how are those of us who are parents leading our children? Um, are we raising them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Are we leading them to Christ? Or are we an example of death to them? Are we leading them astray in the things that we do and the things that the example that we give to them? Um, as we speak to, as we participate in the workforce, are we mirroring Christ in that environment? Are we giving people a false impression of Christ? Are we leading them astray in the way that we practice our Christian walk? It's a um, those of us who are teachers, are we teaching the oracles of God? Are we, are we ensuring that what we're teaching people are the things that are going to lead them to life? Or are we giving people um, the pathway to hell by not teaching them the truth of the scriptures? Verse 45. <coughs> Probably my favorite part of this passage. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you lawyers also. I think that that is like, you remember when you were a kid and uh, your sibling is getting yelled at by your mom or your dad and the best thing you need to do is just keep your mouth shut, right? Don't say anything. Mom's really mad right now. But stupid you opened your mouth, and so what happens? The wrath of your mom or your dad that was focused toward your sibling has now been turned to you. And sometimes the best thing to do is just keep your mouth shut. And I think that that's hilarious that here the lawyer answers up and says, Hey, Jesus, that by saying these things, you indict us too. And, and Jesus turns over to them and says, Well, then woe to you lawyers also. For you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Mm. The law is for thee, but not the law for me. As we think of our current political situation, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Loads people with burdens too hard to bear. They're asking people to do things that they themselves won't do. What's even worse I think what Jesus is referring to is here is not that he's asking them, they're not asking them to do the scriptures and they're not following the scriptures. They're asking people to fill all, you know, to follow all of these little laws, this minutia that they're piling upon them, piling upon them, piling upon them. And they're saying, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. And these people are just they're just wrapped up in the bondage of all of these laws that have been put upon them. Meanwhile, they themselves, while pontificating all of these laws upon these people, are not even willing to do them themselves. I think of the contrast between the people here and then Jesus, who said the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. <laughs> For many. Jesus never asked anybody to do something that he was not willing to do himself. Jesus was the servant of all. And he said, if you want to be a real leader, then you must become a servant of all too. Jesus paid the price for our sin in giving himself on the cross. He gave the ultimate sacrifice. He went and did something not only that, <laughs> you know, that we couldn't even we could we can't even do it. You know, he, he went above and beyond. He not only did the things that he asked us to do, he went beyond that and he did things that he could never ask us to do because there's nothing no way that we could do it. None of us can offer a sin sacrifice. And Jesus did all of that and more. And it's a great reminder to us. I was convicted as I thought about some application. Thinking about things like in loving our neighbor, are we waiting for them to love us first before we love them? In participating in the church, are we, are we willing to let other people set things up and help out or to do the outreach and evangelism or whatever? And we're not willing to do it ourselves. Are we waiting for somebody with whom we're at odds to come to us first to seek the reconciliation before we're willing to 
go to them. Are we placing it on other people to do the things that we are not willing to do? Or are we going to have the attitude that we want to jump in first <laughs> to be the ones to do it? Verse 47. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed, so you are witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your father. For they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, also the wisdom of God uh, said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. Let's stop there. We'll get to the second part here in just a second. Remember, earlier in this passage, Jesus says that this is an evil generation. It's an evil generation because they seek a sign. And um, I think what Jesus is referring to here is that the lawyers, they love to decorate the tombs of the prophets. They would whitewash them. Um, remember in Matthew's account, he talks about them being whitewashed sepulchers with dead men's bones inside. That's not here in Luke, but it is in Matthew. They would decorate the, the, one of the practices when the, when the people would come in for the festivals in Jerusalem. There's all these graves buried everywhere and they would whitewash the tombs and they would decorate the graves and they would honor the tombs of the prophets and things like that. And so what Jesus is saying here is that you love to decorate the tombs of the prophets thinking that you're performing some sort of religious exercise by doing so. But the problem is, is that not only are you not doing what they say, but if you were alive during the time of their preaching, you would have voted to kill them also. You would have participated in their death. Why do we know this? Well, because all of these people are the same people who in a little while longer are going to consent to the death of Jesus Christ himself. Whom all the prophets <coughs> spoke of. You see, that all, like, when the prophets came in times past to prophesy against the king or prophesy against the nation. There were some that were sawn in half. There were some that were drawn in quarters. There were some that were stoned to death. And just as they rejected the prophets that were sent to them, these people are, are, are rejecting the prophet of prophets that are sent to them. You see? And so Jesus is saying here that uh, uh, you, you love to participate in this religious trapping, but you're not listening to what the prophets had to say. You're not putting them into practice. It's like being affiliated with the, the church, but not listening to what the scriptures actually have to say to us. Or we might think, you know, if I were one of those Israelites in the wilderness, I wouldn't have complained against God like they did. That's not true of me. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. Praise be to God for repentance and faith that He's given to me. But man, I have that same sort of attitude a lot of the time. Where I complain that things are hard and difficult. And I wonder why, God, is this happening this way? So He says, You are witnesses and consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them and so you build their tombs and so and so the the witness <laughs> um, sorry wanted to go to 49 therefore the wisdom of God said I will send them prophets and apostles some whom they will kill and persecute so remember they are fools and God says in the wisdom of God I'm going to send them these prophets and apostles. And remember, they are fools because in their foolishness they are rejecting this wisdom of God. I like how wisdom here is sort of contrasted with the foolishness that was mentioned earlier. Look at what it says next. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. All of the prophets culminate with Jesus. And all of the prophets in the, in the past uh, pointed to Christ Jesus. And so because they rejected the one who had come to them uh, about whom all of the prophets spoke, the testimony of all of the prophets will be charged 
against them. That's what he's talking about here. Because they all pointed to Christ. They all pointed to Him. And once again, just like we talked about last week, how other people in times past repented at the Word of God with a whole lot less light, this generation has the Son of God Himself preaching before them, and they're rejecting why would it come from Abel? I thought that was very interesting. How Abel to Zechariah, the son of um, or Ben... Uh, oh, it doesn't say it here. It says in another translation. <laughs> it talks about Zechariah, who's the son of, this, of a priest. Who, during the time of, I think it's Joash, I think is who it was, who he, he was prophesying against the kingdom of God. And they took him and they stoned him to death. And I, I don't know if that's the last recorded prophecy of a of a prophet being killed or not, but I don't know if it's a culminating thing or not. But I thought it was interesting that from Abel to Zechariah, like all the prophets, meaning that Jesus is talking about the span of all the prophets of the Old Testament will be charged against this generation. I thought how Abel acted in the role of prophet in the sense that he offered a better sacrifice than Cain. And when he offered a better sacrifice than Cain, he was put to death. He was, In a way, he was prophesying against Cain and his inability to please God by offering the better sacrifice. So all of the blood will be required of this generation because of that. Because they neither listen to them and they are not listening to him. Verse 52. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves and you hindered those who were entering. And this is a tying together what we talked about previously. Here they are. They're supposed to be the biblical experts. These are the ones that are supposed to be teaching people the Word of God. But instead of leading them to salvation, they are false guides who are leading them to hell. They are not teaching the truth. I feel like it's very commonplace in our modern church for people to call themselves pastors, to people who call themselves preachers, who are in churches teaching things that are not biblical, they are not scriptural, and they are leading people to hell. I'm reminded of the fact that in um, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about those who, you know, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, and he talks about people who are going to say, did I not prophesy in your name. And how there are pastors, there are preachers, there are people who are <coughs> seating themselves in a position of authority, claiming to teach the Word of God, who are doing so and they're leading people astray. So they themselves are not entering in, and they are causing other people not to enter in. I'm thinking of liberal preachers, Word of Faith preachers, people who are teaching all of these things, who sit in a seat of authority, and are leading people astray. Just as these lawyers sat in the seat of authority who had great authority as um, professors of the law, so to speak, and yet they're leading people to hell. You've taken away the key to knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you are hindering others from entering. This is a great reminder to any of us in this room who have been called to be preachers or teachers who have taught in positions of authority, that what we should be teaching should be the Word of God. And we better be darn sure that we're doing that. We better be really sure that we stand uh, and we teach the Word of God as it's meant to be taught. In James chapter 3, James talks about, not let, met, let not many of you become teachers, for in doing so you will endure a harsher judgment. Then lastly, in 53 and 54, Luke gives this culminating statement that not only um, uh, uh, culminates what we've seen here, but also reminds us that from here on out, we're going to see more and more and more clashes with these people. Jesus sends a shot, you know, I mean, it, there's no mincing words here. He has, he, has, he has sort of dug his heels in, and the Pharisees did not like to hear it. As they went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard 
and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. So they've already been doing this to an extent, but now they're going to double down. Now it's, they're nitpicky, they're going to look for every way that they can trip him up. There are people who are just like this. And we need to be prepared for the fact that there are going to be people who are like this. Um, when we preach the truth, when we want to stand up and, and, uh, and articulate things that are appropriate and good, there are going to be people who want to bring us down. Call us into question. Remember that as we walk with Christ, we walk against the grain. We walk um, according to the narrow gate, which is not the easy path. We walk the hard path. And also we walk against the current of society. And so there's going to be times as we walk, we're going to find ourselves being um, sort of solitary going against the vast majority of not only the world, but sometimes the vast majority of the church. And it may feel like, oh man, am I right about this? Because it sort of seems like everybody, even in the church, is against me in the way I feel and what I think the scripture is teaching here. And there are going to be people who are going to nitpick things just like they did with Jesus here and fight him and try to trap him and trip him up and bring him down and things like that. Stay strong in the truth. Jesus was never tripped up by this. This didn't bother him that this happened. He saw it coming. He knew it was going to happen. Whenever you walk in the way of truth, you can expect resistance like this to come against you. Don't be discouraged by it. It happened to Jesus. It's going to happen to you. Stay faithful. Stay steadfast. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the word that you've given to us this morning. In many ways, it's a good reminder that the accusations that have been brought against these Pharisees and scribes, it's instructional that we would not participate in the very same things. It's convicting, Lord, to remind ourselves that the attitude of the heart in the way that we live in a love of God, devotion to things of true biblical love and justice and mercy are the things in which we should participate more importantly than the outward trappings that we are able to emulate. Pray, Father, that you would give us grace to not set aside the things that are weighty for the things that are um, just superficial, Give us grace, Lord, to walk in obedience and love for you. Father, I pray as now as we prepare our hearts and minds to celebrate communion together, that you would prepare us for that. For we pray these things in your name, Jesus.